Welcome to the Corruption and Crime Commission's podcast series where we demystify the inner workings of an organisation perceived to be secretive. Public examination. Two terrifying words when you think about it, especially when the Corruption and Crime Commission is asking you questions and the world can watch. The Triple C says they're in the public interest. Critics say they cause reputational damage. Today, we talk to Western Australia's Corruption and Crime Commissioner John McKechnie QC and get to the bottom of the debate. Are public examinations helpful or harmful? Well, what do you say, Commissioner? The Corruption, Crime and Misconduct Act has as its default position that examinations will be private. There's good reason for that. But... It also gives the Commissioner power to order an examination may be in public, having weighed the benefits of public exposure and public awareness against the potential for prejudice and privacy. So it's a balancing act at all times in the public interest. And there are good reasons on occasion why something should be held in public. So, so you can see that they can be harmful, but the public interest outweighs it. Undoubtedly, they can be harmful. Probably in most cases they can. Uh, But the public interest on some occasions may require that they nevertheless be held in public. And in public these days means, of course, available on the World Wide Web because when we hold public examinations, they are live streamed throughout the country, throughout Western Australia and, of course, available overseas. So why do you call people before the Commission? The principal reason to call a person before the Commission is to get evidence or information in the course of an investigation. Most of the people who give evidence do so in private and mostly they are not persons suspected of serious misconduct. They are giving context, information or joining dots. But why make it public? Why make it a public event? Is that just for entertainment value or perhaps to add a layer of pressure? It's not deliberately to add a layer of pressure. I think there's enough pressure when you are summoned to the Commission, whether public or private. It is to inform the public a little more than uh, a report might do because everything will generally end in a parliamentary report and that's one reason why most of our examinations are in private. But to take an example from some years ago, the chief executive of the Shire Shire of Darwin uh, was um, charged and pleaded guilty to embezzling significant number of funds from the Shire. We held uh, public examinations in Darwin uh, so that the ratepayers might know where their money went and, more importantly, how it was able to happen. Now, the people who were examined weren't going to be um, have an opinion of serious misconduct, but the ratepayers were entitled to know who was asleep at the wheel and how did this continue for so long. So can people who are called to appear before you refuse to answer your questions or perhaps even to show up at all? Uh, not without incurring very significant penalties, which might include and has included in the past uh, jail time. A lot's been said about the reputational damage public examinations can bring to a person. Look at Gladys Berejiklian in New South Wales, for example. What are the kinds of things that you consider when you decide whether to do public or private? The overall consideration, as I said, is the public interest. And what does that mean? Well, it's a very difficult concept. Judges and lawyers seem to use it all the time and it's hard to explain. It's one of those things where you think to yourself, is this an important enough story to be get out now rather than wait for a report? Uh, What damage will it do? What right to privacy do people enjoy? But against that, uh, it is a means of holding public officers to account. Uh, The public can see their responses to sometimes difficult questions put to them. And that's part of our open democracy. 
Your public examinations, well, I guess anyone's public examinations have sometimes been called a a star chamber. There's not a lot of protections or transparency um, that you might see in in a traditional court hearing, no legal representation for witnesses, no chance to object to questioning. Uh, How do you respond to that? Well, those people who call it like a star chamber generally have absolutely no idea what the star chamber was. And... It isn't the case that people are left to themselves. They are entitled to be represented, and most are. They are. Their lawyers are entitled to ask questions. They are entitled to know the scope of the investigation. There are quite a lot of safeguards, and the Commissioner uh, may also restrict examination in public, perhaps hold some in private and some in public. We do not follow the New South Wales model at all. So do people generally lawyer up or or do lawyers get in the way? No, they generally will come with a lawyer. There is, in fact, a provision that allows them to have their expenses or reasonable expenses paid uh, by the state because it is important that people are represented. It is their reputation on the line. So paint the picture for us. Who's in the room? How does it all go down? Well, the Commissioner presides over the examination. The examination room looks very similar to a court. Uh, There will be counsel assisting, who is as a lawyer, that the Commission uh, has appointed to ask questions on behalf of the Commission. Commissioners generally adopt a pretty hands-off approach to examinations. That is, they don't intervene, take over the questioning and lead it. Rather, they allow counsel to do it. It's important for the commissioner to remain detached from the process so that the commissioner can objectively uh, consider whether the witness is honest, truthful, trying to do their best. And it's hard to do that if you're also in the scrum, so to speak. The other people in the room will usually be the investigators, the hearing coordinator, of course, because... We don't have documents. Everything is electronic. All the witnesses are shown are electronic exhibits. There is some small space for the public, uh, but with live streaming, uh, mostly people watch it from their desks, as I've been told. And of course, most importantly, there is the witness themselves and their lawyer. So how do you prepare for an examination? You say you shouldn't interfere with questioning, uh, but... What's the person in the witness box to expect and what can they do to give themselves the best chance in front of you? Well, the easiest answer to the last question is tell the truth. (laughs) That will give them the best chance, even if the truth is unpalatable. Uh, So far as my preparation goes, while I am, of course, ultimately oversee all investigations, I try and keep a distance so I will know generally Um, what the topic is, but I deliberately don't inform myself of the detail, Uh, that's counsel assisting's job. I sit there to preside and also because ultimately any report or opinion formed is mine alone, uh, to give myself the best chance of being a little bit removed from the process to be objective. So counsel assisting's done a fair bit of work before they enter the room? Yes, counsel assisting carries carries it, as you can see in the current Royal Commission, where there's relatively small interventions by the commissioners, but counsel assisting will do the examining and cross-examining. You must feel pretty bad when people are clearly really upset in front of you, you know, really stressed, or even break down in tears. Well, as a human, that's natural, but I've been a judge and a prosecutor and a commissioner for a long, long while, and I'm relatively unmoved by everything, every emotion. And it's hard always to judge how real the emotion is. And it's not particularly because they are in front of the commissioner giving evidence in public. It's because of what they may have done, which has caused their difficulty. But you're not a callous man. No, uh, I hope I'm not. But on the other hand, there's a firm public interest in the integrity of our public sector, in the protection of the public purse, which I think 
outweighs individuals' hurt feelings. After, and and you talk about your time as a Supreme Court judge, after so many years as a Supreme Court judge, then director of public prosecutions uh, before that and now the Corruption and Crime Commissioner, you surely must have heard every excuse under the sun. How how easy is it to pick it when someone's trying to, to pull the wool over your eyes? I have heard, I think, everything that could possibly be uh, said as an excuse. That said, I'm not one of those who believes you can tell a liar by looking at them or body language or anything of that nature. I've had experiences. I remember one murder case in particular where a man murdered his wife, buried her uh, behind the back shed and then carried on as if nothing had happened appeared on television in a heartfelt appeal for his wife to come forward because she'd run off. He was missing her, the children were missing her. Interviewed by the police, continued the story, offered to go with them that very night to check the back of the shed, could there be nothing there? Uh, He was a first-class liar. If you didn't know the end of the story, which was that the police dug up and found the body and he had uh, removed himself to Melbourne, was extradited back. You'd believe him watching him on television or watching the police interview. So that's always been in my mind. What usually stumps people is what they've said before or written before, and that's the best indicator. They may say one thing to me, but an intercepted telephone call will show a completely different thing. It must give you immense satisfaction when your hearings do result in the truth coming out. It does. That's the reason we do it and that's the reason we're here is to get at the truth. We don't always form opinions of serious misconduct after examinations. We may well take the view we've listened to everybody and there is nothing there. So people who lie are obviously very annoying, but what about those people who are constantly saying, I can't recall? We get quite a lot of that, and that's nothing new. Uh, If you go back 30 years to the Royal Commission into the activities of government, WA Inc. Royal Commission, uh, their computer more or less gave up counting. (laughs) I don't recall. In fact, the investigators had an amusing tie, non possum recordari. It's a refuge, or can be, it's a refuge of scoundrels, uh, but a good counsel assisting, a good cross-examiner can usually show that the person can recall or an ordinary person would recall the particular event in question. Uh, It's an easy shield, but it doesn't really shield very often because counsel just keep going. And um, obviously there are times when something happened so long ago it would be reasonable not to recall it. But the sort of things that we're asking about everybody would remember. The theme for the 2021 International Anti-Corruption Day is you're right, your role, say no to corruption. Do you think the prospect of being dragged into the Commission to give evidence against someone at a private or a public examination actually deters some people from coming forward and, and making allegations? I think that might well be a factor in some people, but we have... Uh, very considerable processes to protect people, ranging from whistleblower protection, victimisation of witnesses and the like, and we make it as easy as we can for whistleblowers to come forward and give evidence and not be identified. It would be highly unlikely that you'd ever see a whistleblower in a public examination. Mm. We'll talk about whistleblowers another time, but one of the other frustrations is that if a witness confesses a crime to you in an examination, as I understand it, that evidence can't be used in, in court. Uh, that is correct, or nearly so, because there is one exception. And the reason for that, and that is common throughout Australia in relation to anti-corruption authorities, is our main aim is, as I said earlier, to protect the public sector integrity. And it's sometimes more important to do that with an investigation and a report to Parliament than a prosecution. So what Parliament has done is enact a balance. A person can come before the Commission is compelled to give evidence against their interest, 
but that is not the rule in relation to the criminal law where everyone has the right to remain silent. And so Parliament's solution is to make everything that is said in the Commission inadmissible in a court if it's said to be against a particular person's interest. The one exception which is unique to this state is that if a person subsequently gives a different account in court, it may be that what they've said in the Commission can be tendered into evidence to rebut their different account. So, Commissioner, what happens after a public examination? Where does, where does everything end up? Well, after a public examination, that may not be the end of the investigation. Generally, the investigation will have been uh, ongoing for many months. The public examinations are held or private examination. What follows then is a report to Parliament. And that's very important in the context of a public examination because uh, before a report can be given to Parliament, we are obliged by procedural fairness, amongst other things, and by statute, to give people an opportunity to comment or respond to anything adverse that might be said about them. So that's a further built-in protection that a person might have before a report is tabled. But the report is usually the end point of an investigation. So public examinations, nothing to fear? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but people can be assured that we do not treat them lightly. We consider each application for a public examination and make a decision on what we regard as the public interest and the best interests all round. It's not a decision which I leave to uh, commission officers. It's a decision I or the acting commissioner will make in each case. Commissioner, great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Corruption and Crime Commission's podcast. To listen to more podcasts, visit www.ccc.wa.gov.au or follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or YouTube.